You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. y'all. This past week, Rich and I were invited to speak to a group in Denver about our podcast and about the Civil War. Well, Rich did the speaking on our behalf, and I thought it was so good that I encouraged him to sit down this weekend and record his talk so that we could share it with all of you. So that's what he's going to do. And then I'll hop back in at the end of the talk, and we'll be back next week with the next Chickamauga episode. Hey everyone, Uh, thanks for inviting Tracy and me to be here today with you. Well, as you just heard, apparently our claim to fame is that we do a Civil War podcast, and we've been at it for a while. In fact, in the next month or so, we'll hit the milestone of having done the show for 10 years, which will be something to celebrate. I mean, that's longer than some people's marriages, right? And it's quite a bit longer than the actual war which you may recall went from the spring of 1861 to the spring of 1865. But during the past 10 years of doing the podcast, we've produced about 530 episodes. Uh, Just this past week, we released regular episode number 395, and the regular episodes are those shows that are free for anyone to listen to, any place you find podcasts like Apple or Spotify or Google or what have you. But there are also over 130 members episodes, and those are the extra shows that are available to the folks who have signed up to help support the podcast on a monthly basis at different levels of membership. And we call those folks the Strawfoot Brigade, which is just a fun name that we came up with because So the story goes, back in the Civil War days, one of the names for a new volunteer was Strawfoot, because so many of the country bumpkins who started training didn't know their right foot from their left foot that the officer, or whoever was drilling them, would put a bit of hay in one boot and a bit of straw in the other and teach them to march by calling out, hey foot, straw foot, hey foot, straw foot. (laughs) So... So there you go. And if you don't get anything else from my talk today, you have that bit of Civil War trivia that you can share with family, friends, and neighbors and watch their eyes glaze over. Because, let's face it, regular people don't care about our Civil War trivia. Uh, But we're very thankful for the members of the Strawfoot Brigade, especially since when we started the podcast, we weren't even sure if anyone would want to listen to it. But as it turns out, a lot of people have listened to it. In fact, we just recently passed 19 million total downloads. I remember back when we hit 1 million downloads, and Tracy said, Wow, a million of anything is a lot. (laughs) Which is true. Well, maybe here when we hit 20 million, we'll have to get an ice cream cake or something. And that can also be our 10-year podcast anniversary celebration. <laughs> 
If you are listening to this, then obviously you know what a podcast is. Nowadays, everybody and their brother has one. But that wasn't always the case. Back in oh, around 2010 or 2011, when I was working at the University of Colorado Hospital Records Center over here in Aurora, uh, part of the day I'd be in the office and part of the day I'd be out in the warehouse actually pulling paper charts. And while I was out in the warehouse, I'd listen to music on my iPod. Remember those? Uh, but then I stumbled across this thing called a podcast. I, I wasn't exactly sure what that was, but it sounded interesting, so I downloaded a few and listened to them and was hooked. I was listening to news and political podcasts, but mostly history podcasts, because history has always been my thing, my great passion. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in history, and for a while after college, I taught high school social studies. But my special area of interest has always been military history. Well, anyway, this listening to uh, podcasts went on for a year or so. But then one day I was listening to one of the military history podcasts that was out back then. And the show, to be honest, wasn't that great. And a thought popped into my head. I thought to myself, hey, you know. I could do a better job at this than these guys, which was a pretty bold statement since I didn't know one thing about doing a podcast. But to me, history has always been about telling a story, and I was pretty sure I could tell a good story. So assuming that were true, that meant I just need to figure out the technical aspects of recording and making episodes and releasing them out into podcast land. Okay, so I had the start of a plan. Oh, I also decided I'd need a co-host, since the podcasts I liked best had more than one person talking. I mean, think about it. If just one person is speaking especially if it's a person you can't see but are just listening to, then that one person will have to work awfully hard to keep it from being just a boring lecture, right? But if you have two or three voices, then that in and of itself automatically makes uh, things a little more interesting. So I cast about for a co-host. I went through a lengthy and intensive process of interviewing candidates. <laughs> well, just kidding. I actually just told Tracy one day about my idea to do a podcast and ask her if she'd be willing to help me. I, uh, I assured her that I'd do all the work, all the podcast stuff, and all she'd have to do is sit down with me once a week in front of a microphone and read a script that I'd prepared for us. Well, here we are 10 years and over 500 episodes later, so if she'd known what all she was getting herself into, she probably would have said no. But thankfully, she said yes. Of course, I'm glad she did. I thought it would work out well with the two of us not only being husband and wife, but I'm from Pennsylvania and she's from Arkansas, so you have the whole north-south thing going on. And then there's also just the male voice, female voice aspect that I thought would be a bonus. Mm -hmm. And I, I think having the two of us do the podcast has turned out great. If it hasn't, it's, it's kind of too late to make a change. Um, but it hasn't always been easy, though. Sometimes in the course of human events... And in the course of a marriage, sometimes there are moments when two people just aren't on the same page, so to speak. And there have been a few times, I think, that both of us have wondered if our marriage would survive a recording session. But somehow, with a lot of patience and grace with each other, we always make it work. I know neither of us could have anticipated back in the fall of 2012 how this Civil War podcast would not only last this long, but actually become a part of our marriage. But it, it definitely has. In fact, it's become a big part 
of our life. Back then, when doing a podcast was just an idea rattling around in my head, I narrowed the potential subject matter down to Napoleon, World War II, or the Civil War. Because for me, those had always been the big three with regard to my interest in military history. Well, there were already Napoleonic and World War II podcasts, but no one was doing a Civil War podcast. Hmm, that's not exactly true. There, there was one guy doing a podcast where he'd interview the authors of books about the Civil War, but no one was doing a Civil War podcast like I had in mind. And what I had in mind was starting at the beginning of the war in 1861 and construct a, a chronological narrative, walking through the entire war, month by month, year by year, until the end of the fighting in 1865. So, okay, we were going to do a podcast about the Civil War. But then I realized I had to decide where to actually start it. And there were really two options. Option number one, start with the first shot, fired at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina in April 1861, Or, option number two, start with the background to the war and talk about what all led up to that first shot being fired at Fort Sumter. Well, if you've listened to the podcast, then you know that we went with option number two and started off with the background to the war. And that just seemed the best way to do it. I mean, the North and the South didn't just wake up one day in 1861 and think to themselves, hey, let's have a civil war. No, obviously there had to have been quite a lead up, quite a build up to something like that. And it seemed like people would be interested in learning about that build up to the war. And I thought it'd maybe take a couple of episodes to cover the background to the war, and then we'd get to the fighting and battles. Well, It took us 30 episodes to get to Fort Sumter, and honestly, we could have taken twice as long talking about the background to the war. Uh, After deciding how to begin, I also thought about where to stop the podcast. And again, there were a couple of options. We could end the show when the fighting stopped, when the Confederate surrenders at Appomattox and other places took place. But I kept asking myself, did the story of the Civil War really end when the fighting stopped? And the answer I kept coming up with was no. And so I realized that if we were going to tell the whole story of the Civil War, then we'd not only have to talk about the background to the war, but we'd also have to cover what happened after the fighting stopped. And that meant talking about Reconstruction. Okay, so that would be the podcast. We'd cover the background to the war, we'd talk about the war itself, and then we'd wrap up the podcast by covering Reconstruction. And again, not knowing what I was getting us into, I thought maybe it would take two years to wrap up the podcast. Perhaps a hundred episodes, and then we'd be done. Yeah, obviously, I I really had no idea what I was getting us into back then, as here we are, 10 years and over 500 episodes later, and we're still plugging away at it. From listening to other podcasts, I had a few ideas about some things that I wanted to do with our show as far as how to structure it. And this first idea is really just about communicating effectively. I mean, to me, doing a history podcast comes down to this. We have information that we want to share with people. So what's the best way to communicate that information? Again, to me, it comes down to telling a good story, 
And part of what makes a good story good, a big part of what makes a good story good, is how information is shared with the listener. So, as far as communicating the information, my idea was to break up each episode into segments, or chapters. In other words, to somehow have breaks in between the parts of the story. And back then, no one else was doing this, which I didn't understand. Because even with my favorite history podcast, if it was just 30 or 40 minutes or longer of unbroken dialogue, then I sometimes found my attention wandering. I mean, for the most part, that's just not how we're wired today as human beings, right? Nowadays, it's difficult for most people to pay attention to something for that long. And so I thought about the chapter breaks in books, or even how TV shows have commercial breaks, or how plays and movies shift from scene to scene. So my idea was that I would write each episode so that it's broken up into different segments, or scenes, or chapters. And to this day, that's how I write each episode, and that's the way we record each show. And then later, when I'm editing the episode together, I'll insert some music, just a short military-sounding drum roll, to break up the different segments of the podcast. It's a bit of extra work, but I think it's worth it, because it gives the listeners a break, so they aren't really having to give you their undivided attention for 30 straight minutes. And those breaks also indicate to them, okay, that scene is over, now here's a new one. We're done talking about that, now let's talk about this. And structuring each episode that way also helps us as we're recording, since we just record one segment or chapter at a time, rather than trying to record all 30 minutes in one go, which, trust me, is a long time for two people to sit and talk into a microphone as they're reading a script. Uh, Another idea I had was to include a book recommendation at the end of each episode. When I'd listen to other history podcasts, I couldn't count the number of times I'd think, wow, that, that was really interesting. I'd like to learn some more about that. I wonder if there's a good book about it that I could pick up. So from the very first episode, we've included book recommendations as part of the podcast. They aren't really book reviews. It's just us making a recommendation. In essence, saying, hey, If you'd like to learn some more about this topic or person or battle on your own, then this book is a good place to start. And yes, that means we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books and magazines and journals about the Civil War. In fact, they're everywhere. In the house, in the garage, in every room and nook and cranny in the house, except maybe the kitchen. Oh, the last thing I'll say about a very definite idea I had about the podcast before we even got started is that I knew I wanted to use some great music at the beginning and at the end of each episode. I knew from listening to other podcasts that the music that opened the show could really set the tone for the entire podcast. The only, only problem was that I didn't exactly have a great song already in mind. So I started to listen to songs, a lot of folk music, a lot of Americana, a lot of period pieces, but nothing really clicked. I, I listened to dozens, probably well over a hundred songs, just believing that when I heard the song, I would know that was it. And then one day I came across a song called Midnight on the Water by the Spiritwood Music Northwoods Ensemble, and within probably 10 seconds, I knew I'd found it. I'd found the song. I was so excited. So I shot an email to Spiritwood Music, and trying not to sound like a crazy person, I told them that my wife and I were starting a Civil War podcast, 
and asked if we could please use Midnight on the Water as the music at the beginning and at the end of each episode. And they very graciously said yes. Well, 10 years on, I still think it's the perfect piece of music for the podcast. I can't imagine the show without it. When we released our first episode in the fall of 2012, it was kind of a leap of faith, since, as I said, we weren't even sure anyone would want to listen to it. Uh, Back then, iTunes was pretty much the only platform for podcasts, so after we recorded the first episode, I submitted it to iTunes and waited for it to be approved, after which it would go live. That is, it would just be available to the public. And that was quite literally it. It went live on iTunes, and people started to listen to our Civil War podcast. And let me tell you, but if you think the Civil War and its legacy doesn't matter to people today, that it's just dry, dusty old history that doesn't still stir up people's passions, well, if that's what you think then my advice to you is to start a Civil War podcast and say that slavery was the cause of the war. And you'll quickly be disabused of the notion that people don't care about it. Because as we covered the background to the war, we said that secession, the southern states leaving the Union, was the cause of the war, and that slavery was the cause of secession, was why those southern states left the Union. And we received many, many messages, comments, and emails that were vile, hateful, and vicious. So much so that I stopped letting Tracy look at it, and I screened all the incoming email and all the messages and comments. And that's still true to this day. You know, when we said that slavery was the cause of the Civil War, it was obvious that historical facts mattered very little to some people. But instead, it was those people's beliefs and emotions that were driving their responses. We pointed out that the secession documents from the states that were leaving the Union said very plainly the reason was the protection of slavery and perpetuating the South's system of white supremacy. But pointing that out made no difference. It mattered not at all to some people. Some of those people would simply tell us we were wrong. Some people would say, with various degrees of emphasis, that we obviously didn't know what we were talking about. But others, a surprising number, felt moved to express their opinion about us in ways that, frankly, were despicable. Well, that got rather tedious and more than a little discouraging. And during the first year or so of doing the show, there were more than a few times I thought about just throwing in the towel and perhaps starting another podcast on something less controversial, like puppies or ice cream. But thankfully, as time went on, as we got into the war itself, those sort of messages, comments, and emails came in less and less frequently, until today, they're few and far between. It's kind of ironic, I suppose, that one of the worst things about doing a podcast about the Civil War is some of the terrible things that some awful people have said to us. But at the same time, one of the best things about doing a podcast about the Civil War has been some of the wonderful things that some very nice people have told us. <laughs> 
At this point in time, 10 years on, we've heard from people all over the world who have listened to the show. Our two biggest audiences are in the United States, of course, and in Great Britain. For some reason, there are a lot of British people who are very interested in the American Civil War. Who knew? In any case, over the years, we've heard from countless people who have thanked us for doing the podcast and told us they appreciate the time and effort we've put into it. We've heard from husbands and wives who listen to the podcast, from fathers and sons who listen to the show together, from people who listen to it while they're at the gym or walking the dog or on their daily commute or while they're at work or on a long road trip. We heard from someone who listened to it while bicycling all the way around the coast of Ireland, and from a guy who listened to it while hiking the Appalachian Trail. We've heard from people who have listened to it while recovering from surgery, or while they undergo dialysis or chemotherapy, and they tell us it's not only a good distraction, but that they find comfort in just listening to our voices. There are people who knew next to nothing about the Civil War and tell us the way we've presented the information and the way we explain things has helped them understand it all. There are also people who tell us they've read about or studied the war for years, and yet there's still something new they've learned from listening to the podcast. And we appreciate both those sorts of comments, since one of the things I wanted to do from the very beginning was make the podcast accessible and appealing to someone who knew next to nothing about the Civil War, and at the same time, make it interesting to someone who was a Civil War buff. At first, I wasn't really sure how to pull that off, but as I thought about it, I realized that, again, it was about telling a good story. And as far as telling a good story, I think we're fortunate in that with the Civil War, we have an endlessly fascinating subject to share with people. It's a tale that isn't just dry, dusty, boring old history. And one of the most rewarding ways we communicate that to listeners, and a way that seems to resonate powerfully with them, is by sharing the first-person accounts of participants. In doing a podcast about the Civil War, we're lucky that it's a period of time about which there's a wealth of primary material to draw upon, whether it's letters or diaries or newspaper accounts or even the official after-action reports from officers of both sides. And so from the very beginning, one of the things I knew I wanted to do especially once we got to the war and the battles, was draw upon those first-person accounts, particularly from letters and diaries, and share them with listeners. Because as you read those accounts, you realize that, that yes, the people back then lived in a different world, the world of 160 years ago, but still they aren't all that different from us, really. They had hopes and dreams, had worries and fears, were living through extraordinary t- events, but were just ordinary people. Well, in the most recent episode, where we're just starting in on the beginning of the Battle of Chickamauga in September 1863, we bookend the episode with two of those first person accounts a couple of lengthy quotes from an officer and an enlisted man. In the account from the enlisted man, he shares some interesting details about his experiences on the first day of the battle. That normally, as mounted infantry, they would dismount when actually fighting. But that day they were so hard-pressed, they couldn't dismount. And that because his horse wasn't used to him firing his weapon from its back, every time he fired, the horse would jump and nearly throw him off. Well, this went on for some time until the light began to fade, and in the growing darkness, he says, he could see the flame shoot from the muzzle of his gun 
every time he fired at the enemy. I mean, details like that, to me, are, are just fascinating. Uh, the other account at the beginning of the episode is from a letter an officer wrote to his wife, telling her a battle seemed to be imminent, but saying she shouldn't worry about him, that he was trusting to his quote-unquote usual good luck. He told her of how he longed to come home and see her and their children, but he'd have to wait until the present campaign was over and then see if they were given leave. It's a wonderful, loving letter. But then we share that the next day, during the fighting, he was mortally wounded. It's impossible for stories like that to not tug at the heartstrings. The connections that we still feel to the Civil War are often deeply emotional and personal. I have an ancestor who served in a Pennsylvania infantry regiment in the Army of the Potomac. In a group this size, there are probably quite a few of you who have ancestors who served in the war. But those emotional and personal connections don't change the fact that for history to have any value, it must be remembered accurately. This is important because studying the Civil War and Reconstruction can help us understand the nation in which we live today and help us address the problems we face today as a nation, but only if that history is remembered accurately. Those who attempt to whitewash history because it makes them feel emotions that are uncomfortable or because it contradicts their political agenda or personal beliefs, well, that says more about them than it does about the historical narrative that they're trying to edit, erase, or deliberately distort. Here in 2022, 161 years after the start of the Civil War, what's remarkable is both how much America's situation has changed and yet how much remains the same. Certainly there is still the promise to all Americans of the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But just as certainly, we're still struggling and striving to build an America where all persons enjoy equality, dignity, and opportunity. As the Southern novelist William Faulkner once said, the past is not dead, it is not even past. And more than 140 years ago, Mark Twain observed that the Civil War, which had recently ended, quote, uprooted institutions that were centuries old, changed the politics of a people, transformed the social life of half the country, and wrought so profoundly upon the entire national character that the influence cannot be measured short of two or three generations. Well, five generations have passed, and the long shadow cast by the Civil War and Reconstruction continues to affect us today. That's because the Civil War was about more than battles and generals. Don't get me wrong, I'll talk battles and generals with you all day long. But if you study the background to the war, and also study Reconstruction, I don't know how you can escape the conclusion that the Civil War was about more than battles and generals. If you've listened to the podcast, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say that we're big fans of Abraham Lincoln. In fact, in the early days of the podcast, someone accused us of being Lincoln cultists, which that person meant as an insult, but which we've worn as a humorous badge of honor ever since. Well, that was a while ago, but at the beginning of this year, when I decided to get my first tattoo, 
it was Mr. Lincoln's signature here on my arm. I, I only wish I hadn't waited so long to do it. I, I think it looks great. In any case, many of you probably know the story of how Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg in November 1863, some four months after the great battle there, because he had been invited to give a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of the Soldier's Cemetery. You may even recall that Lincoln wasn't the main speaker that day. That was Edward Everett, who spoke for about two hours. But Lincoln's few appropriate remarks, which probably took about two minutes, are what we remember today as the Gettysburg Address. Lincoln was aware that the ongoing war was going to resolve two fundamental questions. One, whether this fragile experiment in Republican government called the United States would survive as one nation indivisible. And two, whether that nation would continue to endure half slave and half free. Both of those questions remained unanswered until 1865, when the issue was decided on the battlefield with the victory of the federal armies and the defeat of the Confederacy. But in November 1863, at Gettysburg, Lincoln was looking into the future. He was anticipating that victory, and he sought to give it meaning. He did that by crafting what I consider to be the finest speech ever given by an American president. That day in Gettysburg, Lincoln sought to give meaning to the ongoing terrible conflict, sought to give meaning to the still incomplete battlefield victory, and he accomplished that in 272 words that elevated our vision as Americans and clarified our purposes, and he summed up that statement of ideals in the phrase, a new birth of freedom. The more I study the Civil War, the more convinced I am that the war was about more than battles and generals. It was ultimately about a nation, one nation indivisible, that came through that terrible conflict, having experienced a new birth of freedom. It is, of course, the the height of irony that the seceding states were willing to tear the country apart and established their southern slaveholding republic in the hopes of preserving their right to hold other human beings in bondage. But by losing on the battlefield, All they did was hasten the emancipation of those four million slaves. That new birth of freedom upended the way of life of half the country. It's that upending that Mark Twain was speaking about when he said it would take two or three generations for the impact of those radical and profound changes to be appreciated and understood. Well, from the end of the Civil War, through Reconstruction, right up to the present day, it's been five generations, and as a nation, we're still dealing with the impact of those radical and profound changes. As Americans, we're still striving to live up to the vision and carry out the purposes that Abraham Lincoln so eloquently spelled out in the Gettysburg Address. It's my hope that everyone who listens to our podcast realizes the Civil War isn't just dry, dusty, boring history. And it isn't just dry, dusty, boring history because it's an ongoing story. Because the story of the Civil War is about more than battles and generals. It is ultimately a story about a new birth of freedom that we are still striving and struggling to live out today as a nation. Admittedly, sharing that message may be a lofty goal for some random history podcast, but it's our history podcast, and we're proud of it.
And when all is said and done, that message about a new birth of freedom is what we'd like to have communicated through it. So what's next for the podcast? Well, three years ago, pre-COVID, when we visited Gettysburg, we let listeners know we'd have a meetup with anyone who could come that day, and we had about 60 or so people show up, and we walked Pickett's Charge together. That was an awesome experience, and we'd like to do something like that again soon. Uh, Speaking of Gettysburg, I'm in the very preliminary stages of working on a Gettysburg book. I mean, we took over a year of the podcast to cover the campaign and battle of Gettysburg, so having already done all of that reading and research and having those scripts, I'd like to turn that material into a book. Although I quickly realized just how much work and time that will take to make a reality. Um, And then recently, just uh, this past month, while Tracy was on a trip out of the country to visit some family, I planned a trip to see my parents in Pennsylvania, and then before returning to Colorado, I thought as long as I was east of the Mississippi, I might as well hit up some battlefields. So I visited Gettysburg, Antietam, Chickamauga, and Shiloh, and shot some short videos while I was at those battlefields. It was a lot of driving and a lot of work and something I'd never done before, so it was a learning experience, but I enjoyed it and people have seemed to enjoy watching them on YouTube, so I'd like to do more of those battlefield videos in the future. However, living in Colorado isn't exactly conducive to making frequent battlefield visits back east. I think our nearest battlefield here is down in New Mexico at Glorieta Pass. Uh, But hey, the 1862 battle there did include some Coloradans. In fact, they had quite an epic trek to get down there. Anyway, hopefully we can have another meetup with listeners sooner rather than later, and Rich will work to make the Gettysburg book a reality someday, and maybe there will be some more Battlefield videos. But other than that, we'll just keep plugging away at telling the story of the Civil War and Reconstruction, one episode at a time. Although, I always tell people that at the rate we're going, finishing the podcast will probably be our retirement project. <laughs>